really horrible disease. Yeah, tuberculosis. <clears throat> and then, and then one day, the sort of consultant came into the room with the senior nurse and said, "Oh, you know, you need to sit down." And he said, "Look, you know, he has skid and sort of severe combined immune deficiency," and it all kicked off from there, really. Just really simply, it just meant that he didn't really have an immune system, so he couldn't deal with any infection, whether it was bacterial, viral, fungal, and any of those three things could kill him. So something needed to be done to actually yeah. save his life, basically. Skid is generally known as the bubble boy condition, an illness so severe that for eight whole months, Alexander's parents could only visit him in a filtered, airlocked hospital room. Without a definitive treatment, these children usually die in the first year of life. The immune system、uh, grows from our bone marrow, and because in these children、uh, the immune system is abnormal,、uh, what has happened in the past is that we've taken the bone marrow from another individual who was matched to the patient, and put that bone marrow into the patient and allowed the. Uh, immune system to grow, but unfortunately we couldn't find a donor. The stroke of luck was the fact that the form of immune deficiency that he had was genetic, X-linked.、Um, not all immune deficiencies are genetic, so it was muted early on. Actually, that you know, possibly if it turned out to be a, a genetic form of the disease, then perhaps we could look at maybe gene therapy. Dr. Gaspar had been working on an experimental trial of gene therapy that effectively switches off the rogue genes that cause skid. We take the bone marrow, we isolate the early cells of the bone marrow, the so-called stem cells, and we culture those cells with the virus that contains a working copy of the gene. And these genetically modified stem cells are then now given back into the patient so that a new immune system can be allowed to grow. The gene therapy had almost instant effect. The benefit was very quick, and his lungs improved very quickly. I think probably by the time he was about two, you're starting to feel, oh yeah, this is really, really good, really great. We got our life back, basically, and our little boy. Yeah, that's true. I mean, for him, he he has got a life. He he would wouldn't be here now. I mean, that's for sure. We do have. Essentially, a, a well little boy, which is fantastic. <laughs> Alexander Locke is a living example of our new mastery of life, a signpost to the future of medicine. In go. Hey, ready, steady. Ready, steady. <laughs> the gene therapy that cured Alexander is only a first step. The great promise of genetic medicine is that it may eventually eradicate many of the diseases that threaten our lives. Looking back, a disease like skids was actually an easy target for gene therapy. That's because it's caused by a single rogue gene. But the real scary killers, like cancer, Alzheimer's, and heart disease, are caused by multiple rogue genes interacting with the environment. That's why sequencing these diseases would represent a milestone in the history of modern medicine. Here in the U.S., for example, 2,500 people die of cancer every day. That's one cancer death every 30 seconds. One person has died of cancer since I began speaking. Scientists hope that the genome of cancers could be the key to uncover the root causes of these incredibly complex diseases. So the Human Genome Project has been succeeded by an even more ambitious undertaking: a map to a cancer-free future, the Cancer Genome Atlas. We know that cancer is caused by mutations in DNA. So the idea of the Cancer Genome Atlas is to take all of the tools of genomics to figure out how the DNA is functioning in a tumor cell, and apply them. Ultimately, try to look at all of the common cancers, which is about 50. For each of those cancers, we would want to look at hundreds of tumors of that type. 
So when you do the math, if we're going to do maybe 50 tumor types, and for each tumor type we're going to do maybe 250 individual cancers, and we're going to try to sequence all of that DNA, you're talking about 12,500 human genome projects. That sounds pretty scary. But you know what? It could be done in the course of the next three to five years. The Cancer Genome Project is a truly monumental task. Its goal is nothing less than to compile an encyclopedia of all known cancers, documenting every single genetic mutation in all known cancers. And yet Francis Collins believes it's doable and that cancer is preventable. Well, so do I. And that's because we have a secret weapon in our arsenal. And that secret weapon is the merger between the biotech and the computer revolutions. Housed in the unlikely setting of a former chapel in Barcelona is one of the largest computers in the world today. The massive advances in our understanding of biology indeed the Human Genome Project itself, have all been due to the exponentially growing ability of computers to perform increasingly complex biological analyses. Mayor Nostrum is a monster of a computer, the most powerful in all of Europe. It weighs 40 tons, it has the power of 20,000 PCs, and it computes at 100 trillion operations per second. It would take a human on a calculator 10 million years to do what this computer can do in one second. Biomedical research has transformed from a largely experimentally based, somewhat empirical approach, uh, you know, mixing things in tubes, to what is now a truly digital science. Biology has come of age. It now takes its rightful place right beside physics and chemistry as a quantitative, rigorous digital science. And that's good. That gives us a much broader ability to really get to the bottom of why illness occurs. Supercomputers like Mare Nostrum enable us not only to identify the genetic roots of most killer diseases, but they also open the possibility of manipulating genes to prevent or cure those diseases. What the biotechnology revolution promises is to literally reprogram our biology. So we have the means of actually turning genes off adding new genes, we can turn on and off enzymes and proteins and other levels of how genes express themselves and treat biology as a set of information processes. We will have the means within 10 or 15 years, I believe, of reprogramming biology away from cancer, away from heart disease, really overcome the major diseases that kill us. And we're in the early stages of that, but an important thing to understand is that our ability to do this is growing exponentially. It's literally doubling every year. The synergy of the computer and the biotech revolutions is propelling us into a future of unprecedented medical mastery, a mastery that will have profound implications on our lives. What will it mean for us if our medical history will be irrelevant compared to the medical future written in our genes? If we know in advance all the risks our genes may hold in store for us? My own DNA test results are now ready to collect. And I have to say, I'm a little bit apprehensive. Part of me says, out of sight, out of mind. But the other part of me says, well, even if it's out of your sight and out of your mind, it's not out of your body. It's not gonna go away just because you don't think about it. It's there. And so it seems to me that it's better to confront reality than to simply ignore reality. Here ah. are your results right here. So here it is. Yeah, here's a CD that uh, has your information on it that you can take home with you. 
You did have this uh, risk marker for heart disease, for coronary artery disease, and your uh, risk was about twofold increase compared Double. to the population. Right. Mm -hmm. But again, if we put that in context for you, then um, coronary artery disease affects about, you know, six per thousand Japanese individuals. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's not terribly common. So in other words, I have twice the risk of getting heart disease, but the average person, the average Japanese, has a very low incidence of heart disease. That, that's correct. Mm -hmm. Well, that's good news. It is. That is good news. <laughs> but what about the health risk that was foremost in my mind? The risk of Alzheimer's disease. Before I took the test for Alzheimer's, I had to ask myself a very serious question. What happens? What happens in the case that it comes out positive? And I said to myself, if it was positive, I would have to sit down with my family, sit down with my children, my wife, and tell them the truth. 